Again, how many have been using Tableau less than a year? Raise your hand. That's pretty typical, about half the group. Uh, how many have been using Tableau one to three years? More than three? No, I don't judge. <laughs> I did have to change my password earlier this week. So uh, This is the viz I'm going to be going through here towards the end of my presentation. And now I'm, you know, for those of you who have seen me speak, you know I like to move around. Obviously I'll be behind the podium for the, the Tableau desktop part. Um, feel free to download this. This is not, if you got your Tableau desktop up and your laptop up, Feel free to download it. It's on my public profile. Uh, we'll walk through a couple things about it together shortly. But obviously, you've got to be on Wi-Fi or on a new connection. Uh, but feel free to download it, and we'll get to it in a second. Let me go back. Does anybody still need that link? Yes. Up there for a second. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carl Rodette. I am a solutions lead at Interworks. Interworks was one of the first partners of Tableau Software. Uh, we really are very grateful for our partnership with Tableau Software, and it's a, it's a big part of what we do. Um, I originally started out my career at a well-known restaurant that is closed on Sundays based in Atlanta. <laughs> and started, I've always been around data and technology. I was there for 13 years, and then in 2013 when I discovered Tableau, and that was my first, oh my goodness, jaw drop moment in this space. I then moved to Arby's and brought Tableau to Arby's and helped build up a data and analytics practice on the IT side there. And then in June of this past year, the opportunity came to start the solutions lead role here in Atlanta. Uh, half of my role is to, to actually do work with great clients like yourself, and the other half of my role is to build partnerships and relationships with folks like Tableau and, and, um, and, and relationships with you guys. So that's my role. Everybody good here? Anybody else need it for another second? Okay, we'll do a couple more seconds. <coughs> I, would, I started with Tableau version 7. Um, so I've seen it change a good bit over the last six years now. My first BI, official BI tool, was actually OBI ED, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, worst case, you can find me on Tableau Public, and it's the highlighted biz, that, the feature biz under my public profile. I've gone over all this already. Uh, my skill sets you know, from Tableau Desktop and Server and ETL and Data Architecture, I've had strong experience in restaurants and retail, so really glad that uh, my friend Jeff Huckabee is here to, to speak because we've done a lot of work and talking together. And also I've got some experience in transportation with Delta Airlines as a co-op. Uh, my favorite new feature that's coming out that I'm super excited about because I love Tableau Mobile on the mobile front. I think there's a great opportunity there. It's a new mobile app they're going to be deploying here shortly. And this is a quote I really want you guys to take away. Take nothing else away, especially the newer users of Tableau. And maybe you're the one that's trying to uh, create some change in your organization, the hardest part of any analytics journey is not the tools. The tools can be hard. Some of them can be difficult to learn or difficult to implement or hard to integrate, maybe because of legacy. The hardest part is not the tools. The hardest part is culture change. And I've seen that consistently throughout my experiences with clients and in my career. It's getting people to think differently about data. Think about how long it took for those of you maybe a little more seasoned professionals Excel to become the mainstream. That wasn't an overnight thing. That took a long time for people to start using Excel. Now we're in a new journey, now we're in a new era with data where we can visualize it and we can make a lot of decisions quickly and the, the, tech, the computing technology and power is better than it's ever been. Well, Paul, you didn't put a time on the agenda, so that's shame on you. So I'll probably be here about four or five o'clock, you guys good for that? <laughs> so my agenda today, is why data biz. I'm going to briefly, especially for those of you who might be newer to this space, and if you're new to this space, I'm excited. I'd love to meet you and talk to you afterwards. Uh, why data biz? Why are we visualizing data? Why Tableau? 
one of the biggest, there's many reasons I, I moved to InnerWorks. Uh, one is our friend Dan Murray, um, but the other is uh, being able to do some of this work that I wasn't able to do as a, a more of a traditional corporate role. So tab, why Tableau is a part of that journey for me. And then I'm gonna show you some of the things I learned doing the business of the day, um, which obviously wasn't my goal. Uh, Tableau was just very gracious in, in giving that honor to me in, in October. So why data visualization? Data visualization drastically reduces the time to understand. Some of you have seen this next example. So if you have, great. If you haven't, this, this will be fun. When you see the biggest number on here, shout it out. He got it right there, 15,000. <laughs> 10 seconds. That took 10 seconds from scanning that. Now what's the biggest number on here? It's the same one, it's 15,000, the blue. Nothing's changed. Take the numbers off, that freaks out financial folks. <laughs> but if the question is, which months Am I more profitable? Which months am I less profitable? And by what category? This visualization <laughs> answers that question. If I don't care about the actual values. If you want to know the least and most profitable month and by what category, this visualization answers that question very quickly. So again, going back, most of us are used to these kind of reports. This is what we look at every day. But it took 10 seconds of a room full of about 50 people to find that number. Here, it probably would take you two or three, and then here, this gives you the answer, maybe without the number, but instantly I know October copiers was my most profitable month and category. Old school BI. I want to report. How many of you work in IT? How many of you gotten this question? I want to report. Yeah, big hand there, I love that. Yeah, raise it proud. And you, and you get a request that looks something like this, right? So we start out with this requirements. All right, tell me about this report you want. Okay, I want, I want to see profit, I want to see it by region, I want to see it by this date, and I want to be able to look at a certain time frame. We go back as an IT shop, we design it, we write the SQL queries, um, we start the SQL queries to, to help provide the design, and then we, we show that design maybe to the user. Hey, this is what we're thinking. Then we develop it. We write the queries, we write the ETL, we get the data shape perfectly, it's, gonna, it's just gonna fly when we run this report because we've minimized how, much, how many queries and how long the query's gonna run. We test it, we iron out some bugs, and we didn't think about that. Then we QA, and then we turn around and we give it back to the CFO six months later. And then what's the CFO's reaction? It's not what I need. <laughs> Or, that's nice, but I, don't, I already have the answer to that question. I want something a little bit different. It's changed. So, one of the things that makes Tableau and data visualization so awesome is there is a new way to do that. There's a better way. I want to report. Well, let's see what data we can find first. Instead of going with that exact request, we can actually do data analysis and discovery. I was rarely able to do this in the roles I had before because I was usually given, I need this report or I need this dashboard. Now I would usually ask some questions and follow up and, and say, well, tell me more about this. But now data analysis and discovery, I can actually dig through and find the true insight that I'm looking for. I can build visuals quickly and rapidly. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you some of that, the journey I went through on this particular dashboard. And then find what sticks. And then that should be our report because like what Ken said, that's not what I need. Well, we could get that on the front end because it's, we can develop so quickly in Tableau. We can build a scatter plot and then show, okay, tomorrow I'll have you this scatter plot. And wow, that's, I like that, but what about this? We can go back and it's, it's quicker iterations. And then finally get the dashboard. That's the report I need. Now I'm going to use it every day. My old CIO at Arby's, uh, the one that was there when I was hired, when he went to Tableau Conference, we took 14 of us to Tableau, or 12 of us to Tableau Conference in 2014 to Seattle. 
and it was an awesome experience. That's still to my, my I guess probably it was my first Tableau conference. It was my favorite one I've been to. All of them have been amazing. And if you haven't gone to Tableau conference, book your ticket now, go. It's the best conference you'll go to, I promise you, uh, at least from a technology perspective. Um, he came back from that conference with two takeaways. He said, that's the most thought-provoking conference uh, I've ever been to. That was the first thing he said. And the second was, and actually Ken, who shouted out, Ken worked with me at Arby's for a little bit. He's, he told us, all right, forget the old reports. Tell me something about Arby's I didn't already know. And this is what tools like Tableau and data visualization allow us to do. Tell me something I didn't already know. We think, again, and remember, it goes back to that first quote I showed you, that, that culture shift. We generally want a standard report. We think we know what we want. But the power of data is it'll tell us something we didn't even know we want. We didn't even know we needed. So if we go into this process with the mindset of, I want to tell you something you didn't already know, I want to tell me something I didn't already know, that's truly data exploration. And that's what I found in this process um, that I'll walk you through in a second. Another thing I love about Tableau is creativity. It's, it's been really interesting to see the last couple of years. I'm learning more about how myself and how I was wired and how I was designed. I'm actually, my sister now is a trainer at Tableau. She has degrees in art education. It's the most artistic one in our family. Um, but we all kind of love data, and love geeky, nerdy stuff, and we have these creative sides to us. And Tableau sits, and this is why I think I also love Tableau, working with it so much. It sits at this intersection of data, analysis, and art all at once. It engages all sides of, of our brains, and that's where Tableau sits, right there, at the intersection of all of that. So that's another reason I think it, it helps drive insight quicker, because it's not just engaging, say, a, a left side of the brain, logical, looking at numbers, and those are important. <coughs> data analysis, that's on here, that's very important. We can't get the insights without the data and analysis. Data's gotta be there, it's gotta be right, it's gotta be accurate. Analysis, we gotta get insight, learn something. But then there's the artistic side, which helps us to even see that insight faster or see something a little bit differently we didn't expect. So Tableau is, I like to say, creatively powerful. And you see that woven through the culture, too, of, of how they design the software. When I joined Interworks, one of the first projects they give a new hire is to write a blog. And the blog has to be a Tableau dashboard blog. It's not a conceptual high-level thing. We can do those later. But they want us to create something not related to anything work-related. It's got to be something we're interested in and write a blog. It was summer. It was June when I started with Interworks. And as I went down, I was like, where can I get? First of all, I've got all these topics I'm interested in. Um, and maybe it's some health data. Uh, I've got a lot of health experience uh, in my family and just in, in my own story. But I had a hard time finding the health data I was looking for. I love sports. Uh, when I was younger, I learned Excel um, on my dad's computer in the basement, playing around with, with football numbers. And, and just that's how I learned Excel. I just played around with it while I was on the computer. So I've always loved looking at sports from a data perspective. So I thought, baseball, how many of you have done this? Kept score at a baseball game. How many remember, how many here here in Atlanta in 1992 when Sid slid? Okay, I was keeping score. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution printed school blank score sheets for all the playoff run in the 91 and 92 seasons. So I remember my, my friend Brian lived in the same neighborhood and we would keep score. We would compare the next day at school, you know, what, how we differed and how we scored the game. But I remember doing that for the game Sid Slid and looking at the bench and saying, Francisco Cabrera is the only guy left on our bench. If he doesn't pull it off, we're going to have to rely on pitchers to get for us. Um, and of course, we know what happened that night. I wanted to create this because I knew Tableau could do it. I knew I could figure out a way to do it in Tableau visually with the diamonds and everything. The problem was I couldn't find a low cost data source to get inning by inning, batter by batter data, in the time I needed to. Um, I could pay for it, but I couldn't find it free. And there's more on that. So actually now, um, at Interworks, we've actually loaded, we, we found some data, and we loaded the Snowflake. That's another story for another day. But, so this visual might pop up on my feet at some point in the near future. So my next thought was, well, let's be creative. So I did find a data source. Uh, Dave Lehman out at, uh, has a Sabermetrics data set on data.world. 
And I was going to look at statistics, hitting, batting, pitching. That's what I was going for. Um, when I was looking for that pitch-by-pitch -pitch data, couldn't find it, but I found something by Dave Lehman. And then I also thought of a theme. I wanted it to look like the old Sporting News. I remember the old Sporting News magazines and newspapers, and I collected baseball cards, something else I'm going to show you in a second. But I wanted it to look like a newspaper. That was a theme I wanted to go after as well. So I, I had baseball data and I had a theme. But I didn't know what my story was going to be yet. So I wanted to, I wanted to construct. The reason I went with this, the newspaper theme is, those of you who know Dan Murray, when he did our training at Arby's, he challenged me long ago. He said, make it right in black and white. Because one of my crutches I tend to use in visualization is color. I, I, I have used color to, to tell something in data visualization, but it's not been a great use of color, to be honest. So that's what I'm doing. All right, here I'm a consultant now. I need to be able to consult you guys on how to best use in data visualization. So let's do a black and white visual on newspaper. It'd be pretty cool. How many collected these? I don't even know what this is. <laughs> so before ESPN, and before we could get online and look up everybody's stat in the history of time, we actually had these things. And actually in my basement, um, proud or sad to say at the same time, I still have about two Rubbermaid containers full of these things. Don't know if they're worth anything. I kept them thinking they would be one day, but who knows if they're worth anything anymore. I don't have this one now. If I have this one that's on your screen, it'd be worth something. Um, I was actually, I actually recreated that, and I'll show you this in the visual in a second. But that's one of those things, just because you can do it in Tableau, should you? I create it as a tool tip, and I'll show you that in a second. So this is another thing I learned in the process, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. So let's get to the demo. I've talked enough on, on concepts, so let's hop over to Tableau. If you've got the visualization open, I'm gonna hop over to this is the actual one that's on the blog. There we go. Switch the mouse here. So this was the final product that um, that got visited the day on October on October the third. There's a couple of visuals. So as I opened up the um, as I opened up the the data source and started exploring. The first thing I noticed in Dave's data set was salary. And I said, that's interesting. Salary data. Huh. And I think it's the analyst kicked on me and said, I bet there's the 80-20 rule in baseball. Meaning 80% of the salary is made by 20% of the players. That was my first gut theory. Let's go look into that. That was the question I had. I'm going to hop over to a, a previous version. So this was the pretty one that ended up getting published. So what I did is I came in here and I, I did this massive, so if you guys download this, I actually did some pretty ugly joins with all these flat files I downloaded from data.world. It's not the best uh, constructed join. I'll just be honest with you guys. Uh, better would be better if I put this into a database or, or joined it a little bit differently or dropped the hitting statistics altogether because I didn't actually end up using the hitting statistics. Um, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Thank you. Thank you for saying something. Duplicate. There we go. There we go. All right. So let me go back to this then. This was the. This is the one that you guys probably just downloaded, right? Um, what I found is I looked in the data. So I plotted. I just plotted. Okay, look at salary. Let's look at average salary. And that's what these are, these different metrics. Um, we've got the highest paid player, and this is percent growth since 1985. So the data set that's in there is from 1985 to 2015. Well, it hasn't been updated in the last three years, but I was like, that's good enough. That's 30 years of data. It's going to show us some really good trends. It's going to show the, it's going to show the effect of the strike. It's going to show the effect of, of steroids, probably, because those are the areas we've been in in baseball over the last 30 years. So highest paid player. Highest paid player in 2015 on this data set, Clayton Kershaw. Made $32.5 million that year. And if you hovered over this, you can see the average salary that year was four and a half or 4.3 million. The median, 337,000. Uh, three, yeah, 337,000. Um, 
that's of anybody who played any games. So we didn't filter on full seasons or any games, but that's just the median of anybody who played any games for Major League Player. Uh, top 5% of household income in 2015 was 354,000, 353,000, and the median was 57,000. So I brought in household income data to give a reference to uh, what we, the baseball data. So percent growth, this is interesting. If you look over here in 1985, Mike Schmidt was the highest paid player at $2, $2 million. Who remembers Mike Schmidt? What team he played for? The Philadelphia Phillies, right? Uh, my, my late grandfather was a big fan of the Phillies. I always called him bums, though, because they never did really win in his life. Um, the average major league salary back then was $480,000. And there was actually an old article I came across that was looking for visuals that talked about the explosion of baseball salaries in the late 80s and how this is ridiculous, how much they're making then. Uh, the median household income back then, $26,000. Um, this is all adjusted for inflation here, so uh, the top U.S. 5% was 100000 back then. So over time, the top guy is exploding 1,400% from 85 to 15. The average grew 8 to 8-fold, the median grew 3.6-fold, while household salaries, whether you're a median, that grew 140%, and the top 50 top 5% grew 245%. So clearly, the story is starting to unfold. So I'll walk you through what I did here. So I, I took salaries, and I took them by player, because I wanted to see each player. And I did a couple of line graphs here. Let me, yeah. this is the first one, so I want to show you this one first. And created these calculated fields. So here's max, average and median. So this doesn't even have the household income in it. This was one of the first things I did. Let's look at it over time. Um, and what I was hoping to be able to find was that 80-20. Can I look at 20% of the players and find 80% of the income? I added an area plot, and then I plotted the actual players on here and their salaries. Um, so you can actually see the different players. <coughs> But one thing that a box and whisker plot, and the box plot actually shows the increasing distance between the bottom and the top. And what thing stuck out with me was the median was growing very slow. So 50% of the players are below the median line. 50% of the players are above the median line. And the average was growing a lot more. And then obviously the max is just blowing away the average. So the story is like there's increasing, increasing disparity. This visual is not great. I can't see all the play. I can't see all the uh, players, but I can certainly see the trend here. So I was like, well, maybe there's a way we can do this with uh, using some binning. So let's bin the salaries and let's look over time. And you can slowly see the tail getting bigger and bigger. In fact, there's actually one where I do it um, over. There's one here I do by league. So red is American League, blue is National League. I thought maybe the leagues are different, and there's a running sum here. The story's still not coming out to me as I'm going through and building each visualization and looking at each data point. It's not coming out to me for the 80-20 rule. Um, I started looking at five position groups, and obviously this is a big mess here. So there's this doesn't tell me a whole lot either. But when I actually remove that area and put a player on the data, and actually put the, change the dots to blue, the first thing I saw was visually the disparity. Because you see the thinning out as we're going up over time of the number of players near the top, and there's you still got this mass of players down here <coughs> on the bottom. <coughs> this is a box and whisker plot, but I'm using a technique called jitter. So what it's doing is it's randomizing the the X position for each of the dots. Normally, for 1985, that's this year right here, I'm gonna just have one big vertical. Remember this first, um, the first visual I, I, I showed you here? So this is one big vertical for each year. So I'm like, well, let's spread them out so I can see the distribution even better. Because the story was starting to tell me, look, there's increasing disparity here. So I'll just show you what the jitter looks like. First thing you gotta do is create a random number. And this is a technique that's 
really you can find out on the web. Um, if you download mine, you can see how I did it. Um, just using the previous value table calculation and, and uh, doing a modulus with some very large numbers allows us to create a random number. Again, you download the workbook, you can see the actual calculation. Uh, this is something that's common, commonly used out in the communities, this particular method. Then, we take the random number and input it into a jitter calculation. So we take the random number, we divide it by another large number, and I multiply it by 100, that's to give me a, a, not a one, zero to one number, but to give it a, an actual like zero to 100 number. Uh, and then I add one so there's no zero in it because I don't want the zero. I don't want the zero axis to come in to play um, on this. And I create an integer out of that. And that's what creates my jitter. So I'm going to take, I'll take the jitter off. And see what happens there. I've got my decades, I've got my years, everything is just tight in one big line. But when I add the jitter back, I now have all of these dots. It's a really powerful way to show data, especially if using box and whisker plots. It doesn't make sense in every case. Um, I've actually was at a client project where we, they wanted it, we looked at it, and we said, nope, this is not working the way you think it will. I'm computing this along each player. So you, when you use jitter, you probably want to use the lowest grain you've got in your data. So I'm using player full name as the level of detail to, communicate, to compute that along. So I have this, and I knew, okay, this is the viz that I want to build off of. This is going to be my showcase viz. And from here, I actually got some feedback from folks on my team. What do you think of this? Where's this going? Does this make sense? One thing people have said, hey, I want to personalize. What makes a really good visualization is to personalize it. That, in that increases engagement. Whether you're in the business world and doing it for, uh, doing it for a client, doing it for a CFO, make it so it's personal that it can relate to it. Um, here, what I've done is created, okay, what's my favorite player? Well, I grew up Dale Murphy. Let's go look for Dale Murphy. And this is really small, so I'll actually show you to in a big biz. Um, but I can actually find my favorite player. Maybe I want to look for, I remember Alex Rodriguez was at a big uh, money. And we can see, you can barely see it up here. <coughs> so I moved from there and I made some changes to the formatting so this is actually easier to do. Uh, a couple things as I walk through. Again, we talked about being able to build things quickly. Um, this was trying to find the top 25 each year. Not much going on there. Um, and then also looked at using, again, binning and, and thinking of a normal distribution or a T distribution. The only thing that's interesting about this is I decided to animate this so I can look at each position. Is that the other thing? Well, if there's salary disparity, which position is the worst? My theory was it was pitchers. Um, but what, the one thing that's nice here is that I can actually see over time, and you see each year builds on, the tails of each of these positions gets bigger and bigger. And actually, there's an interesting thing that happens right at the end. I don't know if you saw it there at the end. I may go all the way to the end. By putting the date on the page shelf, this last column disappears. Everybody has moved out of that lowest bin in salary which is the, I think it's the $200,000 salary then. Um, so there's a minimum income that everybody's making in baseball. But again, this didn't make sense in my newspaper. Remember, newspaper style, I wanted to tell a story, make it right in black and white. I looked at, um, okay, maybe there's something tied to standings. So I'm able to create some standings in here. This was something I created, so, oh, I, gotta, I can look at each year and. Uh, then this is 1995, this is when the Braves won the World Series. Uh, this was a strike shortened season. Remember they started the season late that year in April. Um, and if you want to look at the previous year that ended early, in fact I heard Sports Talk talking about this. Remember the Montreal Expos were rushing it. They're the Washington Nationals on this because that's the franchise that got renamed. Braves would not have had their division streak had the season finished out. The Braves were way behind. Um, but here's the magical year of 1991. So just some of the data I got, I actually got, as I was building this, I had heard a conference several times in the flow. 
And I would think, that sounds great, and that's awesome. The Tableau folks that are super talented on stage, they're in the flow, and they're showing all these things. Being in IT, I was never, quote, in the flow. I never had the, I never had the bandwidth to do some of the stuff in the public space after work hours either. But this was the first time I felt in the flow. As I was going through and asking a question, and then building something and getting an answer. Does this make sense for my dashboard? No, this really doesn't. Um, that's why you don't. You probably don't see this leak standings in the one you downloaded. I'll be happy to share this with you. But it's, this has all the sheets I ever created uh, for this work in here. Years of service versus maximum salary. I just plotted maximum salary for each player that they ever made in their entire career versus years of service. Is there a tie there? Well, there should be, because as you play longer and longer, you should be rewarded for that. And it does seem to be there's a good correlation. Alex Rodriguez played 21 years, and there's 33 million was his max he ever made in a year. Clayton Kershaw had, had up to this point, only played seven, so he was making that much money. Um, this particular case, Tanaka was in his first season, but he signed this massive deal. because He got signed over from Japan with some experience in Japan. But this is a pretty typical shape. Nothing stood out to me here. Uh, World Series winning team salaries. I'm gonna show you something different on that, but my first thing was a bar chart. Um, and then I went to a scatter plot, because I'm, I'm a big fan of scatter plots. All the World Series teams are stars here. Again, this doesn't tell what I want it to tell, but it's showing a trend now that you do buy more, generally, the higher paid talents are gonna win World Series, but I'll show you a second thing there. Then I was looking at salaries versus statistics. Home runs, hits, I can go from home runs to hits, the batting average. Um, actually, this one's, not, this one's not turned on here, but is, is there a correlation there? Um, I did some pitching stats in here because that's, that's what this data set had. But ultimately landed on this. And this was my first release. And I threw it out to my team. I said, all right, tear me up, because we have in our Slack channel a ability to share visualization and give, give uh, feedback on. All right, tell me what's great. And fortunately, we have an incredible visual team that took what I created, and I'll, I'll pivot in a second. So my conclusion was salary disparity rules baseball diamond. This is a newspaper theme, so I had to put some text in here, too. I wanted to actually have some text and guide you as if you're reading a newspaper article. Uh, I've got my, my highlight viz of, okay, this is really showing the disparity between the top guys and the, the average guys. I can come in through here and now I can highlight my player. So uh, a couple, what did I do? Sorry, I tapped my laptop. Again, I, you can see the disparity here. And then this one also has that baseball card. So. There's Todd Stottlemyre, there's Mark McGuire. That's cool, but it doesn't really do much for the biz. But this was the original thing that I created. But I can't come in here and, and look for my, look for, um, let's look for, let's look for Sid Green. I just mentioned him. There he is. Hard to find him though. I mean, you can see the dot down there. I'm trying to get to him here. So, you realize this isn't working exactly the way I wanted it to, so I had to make some changes. The other thing that I put in here was, um, sorry, there we go, I can clear that out. And you can see why this bit didn't make it. There's a lot of uh, little tricky things with it, but I want to show you guys the progression. Um, three decades of team payrolls. World Series champs are stars. No championships are not stars. And for the first half of this biz, till 2001, the World Series champ was near the top of all payroll in baseball. We got a reference line here for average uh, team salary. And then 2002, it changed. You had the uh, Anaheim uh, winning in 2002. 2003 at the Florida Marlins. 04, you had the big payers, the Red Sox. So all the big ones here at the top are the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Giants. But since then, we've had a trend of lower paying teams winning World Series. We know what happened between 2001 and 2002. 
No salary cap. Uh, Famous. Uh, favorite metric. Yes, uh, Billy Bean. Moneyball. Money Another big factor is that the baseball postseason is largely like a lot of randomness because you have teams that are very closely matched. So I think if you look at the teams that made the playoffs, they would tend to have higher payroll. Sure. They also added the wild card in like the late 90s, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Correct. This is great dialogue because everybody's, everybody's passionate about sports and baseball. This is fun. So I gave you guys the link. Download it. Tell something different with the data right there. I mean, make some. Share it with me. Just say, hey, Carl, I love what you did. I'm, I'm going to make a change to it. Look at the playoff games. That'd be great. We'd love to see that. Um, that's what I love about the Tableau communities. We can have this dialogue. But to me, that showed there was a significant impact in the money ball. There was actually teams were now winning, not having to pay for the highest talent. I remember the Braves were near the highest payroll for a number of years, too. Ted Turner was willing to write checks. You know, let's just get, let's get Fred McGriff in here. Let's get... Uh, yeah, Greg Maddox and some of those other big free agent signings that he did. Um, a lot of us Braves fans would like to see the Braves open up the checkbook again and get a couple more players, right? So this is what I created. And at the bottom, I was looking at disparity, and actually third base had the highest disparity. That shouldn't be a surprise, though, if you think about it. There's not a lot of third basemen in the data set. And who was playing third base for the Yankees for a while? Alex Rodriguez. So he was making $30 million, while most other third basemen are, are not the highest paid uh, player in the infield. So that did, when I thought about it, and pitcher was number two. So what is interesting here is I also created one of these diagrams um, using PATH. Uh, this is actually a pretty uh, interesting way to visualize data as well to show the, the gap between pitchers versus position players. And the position players were actually outpacing pitchers in the last 20 years, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and then also had this down at the bottom with a link to the Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin famous commercial. No offense to any of the ladies in here, chicks dig the long ball, but that's the actual commercial they did where the pitchers are actually trying to lift weights and hit home runs. It's a really funny commercial. That got killed too. He said, take this whole bottom thing off, it's not doing anything for you. So what ultimately happened in here is we went to this. So a couple of things I want to show with this when you're creating visualizations too, and this is the create, creative part of Tableau. This custom font, remember the old sporting news thing I showed you? That's not a font in Tableau that we're going to publish Tableau server. We just create an image and just embed it in the dashboard. It's a great trick to use because you know it's going to render properly on any web server, anybody who comes along and looks at it, right? My visual guys on our team, they didn't make a ton of changes. But sometimes the smallest changes make the biggest difference. I just want you guys to see the difference in the two ones at the top here. Let me hide that. So this is Carl's original thing on the right, and this is what they helped me with on the left. Not a lot of change, right? The visuals aren't changing at all. They didn't, they didn't change that top visualization. We did, we did um, add, as you might download, I'll show you some in a second, but just a simple background here. 30 years of paycheck growth. This looks like a newspaper on the left. And when, I, when he came back to me and showed that, I was like, this is incredible. And then all I did was he created an image in the background. That whole thing is an image in the background. All my text and everything. Now, we can't search the text now, unfortunately. Um, but then we just laid the visuals on top of that. The other thing we did here was to make it a little more user friendly. So think about your users as you design. We added a big bubble for the top guy so you can find it. And then instead of the baseball card tooltip, this is actually a pretty useful tooltip. What was Alex Rodriguez's salary growth? Okay, that's interesting. Now I can also come in here too and I can find my Dale Murphy again. And there he is. Oop. It pops up a little bit better on this. And maybe you're, so there's, there's Dale Murphy. Oh. Steve Adrosian, he played some time with the Braves. Um, or maybe, remember Bobby Bonilla was the yeah. highest paid player for a minute? Still getting paid. He's still getting paid. See, there's where he, there's the few years he's highest paid. Look at the little tail at the end. He goes, oh yeah, Bob, and comes back up. But just little, small things. I removed, another thing I was, I removed the axis, and I just used reference lines. Think about a newspaper. They don't generally have a lot of X and Y axes on visualizations, but just use reference lines to show you the scale. 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. Um, small little things like the font. So 
that was my journey here, and then we changed uh, this to decades. So that way, the, the highest paid and the median salary to show the disparity down here by position, by position um, was a little more clear down here as well. So again, I got my data from the census site for the household income and from Big Lake the Saber Metrics and Data.World. Data.World is a fantastic site for data. I'm gonna flop back. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about this visual, and how we did some of the things, um, but you guys have, have free access to it as well. Great. All right, there we go, on the right slide, great. So Tableau, the conclusion here, Tableau allows rapid insight through visual analytics. Think about that salary disparity. I went with one theory, the 80-20, and then I concluded, well, maybe it's not 80-20, but there's a massive increasing disparity with that top paid player and what's considered the half and, and average. That's how we should approach analytics. Tell me something about my company or about myself or about my organization I didn't already know. I didn't know that about baseball. I didn't know that the positions were that disparate. I didn't know that position players were actually better than pitchers. My theory was pitchers were getting paid more and more money. Uh, so that's, that's the insight I drew through this project. Faster development with the new BI methods. You know, if this was old school, I would have had my theory on 8020. I probably would have worked forever to find that query, finally gotten it out, developed the report, and then said, like Ken said at the beginning, that's not what I want. I would have wasted four months doing it. This time I was able to get through all those visuals I went through really quickly on you. Those were all done in about a week time and it's not like 40 hours of like, I was at a client site working on the evening in the hotel room. Um, being able to iterate through different visualizations and drag and drop. Creative and beautiful solutions through robust capabilities. I never thought anything I would create in data would be considered beautiful. The one thing one of my friends said is I want to actually I actually want to fold your viz up and look like, you know, like out on a newspaper on the subway or something. That's, that's pretty cool. And then there's so many other people, even folks in this room I know have created incredibly beautiful things in Tableau. We may kind of scoff, especially those of us that are a little more logical and, and, and really smart with numbers, but something beautiful does increase engagement. Now, don't think that everything you create has got to be absolutely gorgeous, but it's got to be at least a aesthetically pleasing. Think about it, if you've seen bad visuals out there. Um, there's the big book of dashboards where they got the screaming cat on the bad examples, so that's another good book too. Everybody knows what a bad visual looks like. You know what a bad one is when you see it. So creating something beautiful is very meaningful and very uh, helps. Um, interactive data storytelling. So think about a newspaper. Traditionally a newspaper, that's it. It's printed up, you're it. Or a traditional report. It's a can, we call it a canned report. That's all you can do with it. You can look at it and I can throw it away. Or it goes in a big file somewhere. This is interactive and it can change if I update my data set. I can actually ask another question. You can dive in and ask another question. I love the playoff question there. You know, hope, hope someone takes my visual and does something even better with it. Because you guys are, a lot of you are a lot more talented than me. And then fun analysis in the flow. I've always been jaw-dropped and amazed and loved Tableau. I was a big champion everywhere I've been with it. Um, in fact, I joked with my dad, who's actually here today, and he said, finally, he's drinking the Kool-Aid. He understood what I've been talking about all these years. Um, but I actually felt, I actually clicked. This is why Tableau talks about being in the flow, because I was literally creating visual after visual, and then going back through, okay, what, what makes sense? What am I seeing here? And it was fun. It's like, this is like a lot of fun. When you, when you spend two hours in Tableau Desktop on a topic and you don't realize, oh, it's not 11 o'clock, I should go to bed, I gotta be at the client site in the morning. But that's fun. That's what makes Tableau different. That's why I'm using Tableau, that's why I'm doing the role I'm doing, that's why I love my work, and that's why I love being here with you guys who are super smart, super creative, and have awesome ideas. That's why I encourage each one of you to just try it. If you never done anything in Tableau Public, just try it. Put something out there, show progress. You'll see my Tableau public profile is actually pretty minuscule because most of the work I've done over the years has been for uh, my company and I couldn't share it. Uh, but my goal is to do something once a month to publish it out there. Just start somewhere. I encourage you to do it. It's something you're passionate about. Go try to find data. Um, but let's keep that dialogue going. 
Our team at Interworks, our Southeast team, likes to end every presentation with a quote, and I love that. So um, one of my favorite CEOs I've ever worked under his leadership, Dan Caffey at Chick-fil-A, he has a quote, we should treat everyone with honor, dignity, and respect. That's there. That's what's behind their service model. Um, so it's a quote that, that I actually love. It's a great reminder. And I think we do a really good job for the most part in, in our Tableau community too online. When we submit something and one we're encouraging, that's honoring and great work, dignity and respect. Hey, you know what would be a great idea? What if we looked at that playoff winners? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. That's honor, dignity, and respect. It's, it's fantastic. So I think it's something that really embraces our community as well. Uh, we're just a real quick thing on Interworks, where people focus technology consultancy, and we can help you anywhere on your data journey. So, thanks for your time. That's how you can get a hold of me. Um, I have to I had to plug our Interworks quickly because they were a big part of this this of the day. I can't take all the credit. This was a team effort. Uh, if you saw any tweets around it when it came out in October, I kept tagging folks on my team that helped out. Um, that's the other thing: is don't be afraid of making your stuff a team effort. When you put all our brains together, we can do some pretty amazing things. So with that, any questions? We'd love to hear any questions you guys have. Also, were you using a lot of floating? So the first the first iteration, I tried to avoid floating. Um, the reason, because when you resize and people look at different, you know, I didn't want to have to create a mobile version and a phone version and all that. By using containers, I know Tableau is going to render it as best it can for each of those. Um, but ultimately, I had to go floating on that last one because there's an image in the background, and I just had to pop my visual in. Our our guy who's really good with UX experience and helping <coughs> at Interworks, he said this is the best way to do this, and we'll just lock the resolution down. That's why probably the version you download it probably has like 1,100 pixels in the file name. Um, we locked the resolution down so it can't change, and we just said, if you're on a phone, you're probably gonna have to turn your phone this way and scroll up if you're looking at it on your phone. Um, it, was a, it was a decision that we had to make on the design, just to say, if you want this to be a newspaper, if that's your priority, this is what we gotta do. There's a cost to any decision, right? Yes, over on the far side. Carl, uh, thanks for sharing. Um, I had a chance to look at this earlier, and it was, it was interesting. Uh, I was a former, I was a newspaper designer in a former life, so I was especially interested in your explanation about why you stuck to black and white and mm -hmm. sort of limited yourself to that. If you could have used more color, how would you have done that? Um, if you remember the blue scatter plot um, with the, the box, box and whisker plot, to me that looked like stadium seats. And I so wanted to go with that um, because it looked like a stadium as the disparity, you know, and that's, <laughs> If we had transparent backgrounds when I put this, I probably would have been tempted to try to just underlay the stadium underneath it just to show that same slope. Um, so I probably would have left the blue in there, but our visual guy said the only one that really makes sense for color is the top one, because that screams the message in the data story. And, and the whisker, that was the median salary, the, the whisker? Uh, top whisker is the top uh, quartile. Okay. The box is um, the the median is the, the middle bottle box, okay. right? So the top is the top quartile, bottom quartile, and the whisker is the, the range. Yeah, good question. The text in the dashboard, is that hand keyed or did you use any of the NLG APIs that are available today? I wish I could have said I did the <laughs> APIs with that. Um, we actually have started doing some work with automated insights, um, okay. but I didn't do that. It was, it was more just my, what I saw in the data, plus some knowledge I already had about baseball at the time. It was like writing a little article. Yep. And then it became an image in the end. Could you speak a little bit about how you did the decision process, so how you juxtapose in your evolution, you know, you're looking at one visualization, and you know it's not the result, but it's kind of like it's good enough for now, and maybe the editorial is changes later. You know, but I know that the answer is mm -hmm. somewhere in this. That's a great question. Uh, I love that question because I've gotten caught in that trap of trying to make it perfect before moving on. Um, in fact, I was at a client project doing that. I was like, oh, I want to make this look better, and I probably should have. I would save myself some time by just saying, I'll get back to that. 
I think it was because I saw something I didn't expect to see. And when I saw that, I was like, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an answer I didn't expect. A lot of time I get caught in the, the visual trap because I kind of expected that, now I just want to make it look right. Um, so that's a great point. So I have the right mindset in this one. I've done other work, but maybe I have the right mindset. I'm, I'm trying to force the results. Good question. Who else? Okay. A little bit about um, just advice you have on, on data modeling. I know you mm -hmm. mentioned um, trying to figure out the best way to kind of put data together. And yep. I feel like that's one of the challenges that I'm having with some mm -hmm. of these projects is trying to visualize the data model that Pebble's going to like um, and trying to combine with different data sources. So if you could talk to me a little about resources you recommend on that or, or how um, you approach it for these projects. Wow, that's a big question. Um, as far as especially the resources, uh, some of them are, well, you'll find in the community. You know, just throwing out a question in the Tableau community if it's, if it's pretty specific, um, trying to do this with data, what's the best way to shape it? Um, some of it's just been through experience. I, I started out as a DBA at Chick-fil-A, and then did a lot of ETL work. So I learned a lot about data shapes, and then got into reporting and analytics about three years into my career there. So I understood a, a good bit of the relationship. Um, with this particular project, I'll speak to that, it was a bunch of flat files. So what I, I, what's the best I think to get to is what's my lowest level detailed data? What's the fact I'm trying to aggregate on? Some average, this one was salary. And where, if you download it, you'll see some other stuff in there. You also see I'm doing a level of detail calculations. I'm duplicating some salary stuff in there um, because it's tied to team players that get traded for teams. Teams is another dimension that gets pulled in, some of the statistics, especially when they change leagues, you'll see that in that data. But the key is to get to what's one row of data that I can start aggregating on. What's that need to look like and build the model from there? Uh, lowest level. So this one should have been season, player, salary, and almost ignoring the team and having the team as a separate data source. If I do it again, I would have modeled it that way. Um, but think about what the lowest level is, and then model up from there would be my first thing. Then dimensions, is the other thing, so if you think about a data modeling, uh, dimensions, you gotta think about what question I'm asking, how, um, and why. So salary by league, salary by team, salary by player, salary by position, all those now are dimensions that I've got put in. There's some good books out there, there's some good data modeling books. Um, there's a data warehousing book, I can't think of the author right now. Um, Agile Data Warehouse Design, there's some good exercises in there. Um, the names of the tip of my tongue of the author of that book. So that's a good one on data warehouse design basics. Um, some of the database vendors themselves have some good documentation out there uh, on good practices. Did you use prep at all? Um, I started down the prep route for, um, what was I trying to do? with it. I, I was playing with prep on this. And this was not really my first time using prep because it had just come out previously in the year and I never used it at work. I ended up spending a day on it and said, you know what, I don't need to use it for this. Um, I think what I was trying to do was create one, instead of doing join all these flat files, I just wanted one data source, right? Instead of having all the data, and I realized, you know what, I'm going to spend more time doing this because I don't know prep as well as I know just pulling these flat files in and going with it. Um, I have since then, um, used prep on a, um, I did not publish it, it was a Sports Viz Sunday one, and prep actually allowed me to do some pretty cool stuff for that. Um, and actually there's some basketball data I'm looking at that I've used prep on too. So I default to prep going forward. Um, I think there's times, it, it, I, I think it can help a lot. Um, we also use Alteryx as well, so that's a, that's a tool I have access to, and I'm, I'm very familiar with that. I've used that for a number of years, so I'm more comfortable in Alteryx. Um, but if you don't have Alteryx prep, it's actually, it's, it's very, very good. Um, especially if you need to reshape data now, and or join in with another, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to explain what I'm trying, what I've got in my head. So if I've got uh, historical data over time, and I've got another, and it changes, I've got a slowly changing dimension, basically, if there's no data modeling, it's a dimension that's, um, I'm, like I said, I'm assigned to this team one year, and I'm assigned to this team another year. 
and then maybe I have different opponents at the same time. Prep was a really good way for me to start looking at how to create one row with all those changes built in. Yeah. And then I was able to spit it, I could spit it out in one file. That's the other nice thing about it. And then just have a little just it and good to go. Um, for Tableau Public stuff, like the Sports Biz Sunday, Makeover Monday, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll look at prep. I feel like I need to reshape the data. I'll look at that first. Um, for most of the project stuff, I'm looking at Altrix. That's usually what's being used. So. Good solution. Good solution. 2018.2. Initially, and then the last version, I think, is 2018.3, because uh, it came out right when I, right about when I published the Viz, 2018.3 came out, and I've since made a couple changes and re-uploaded it, so, um, yeah. 2019.1, it could do some cool stuff with it, with the transparent, you know, with some of the other stuff, so. Anybody else? So, any questions? <coughs> Turn it back over to you, Paul. Thank you.